Misty Copeland is one of ballet's biggest superstars. A child prodigy from an abusive background, she would go on to make history as the first black female principal dancer at the American Ballet Theatre. She's performed with Prince, advised President Obama on policy, and was listed as one of the world's most influential people by Time magazine in 2015. Misty Copeland, welcome to The Economist Asks. Hi, thank you for having me. Now, I'd like to take you back this time of year to your first ever ballet performance. You were, I believe, about 13 years old, and it was The Nutcracker. And by my powers of deduction, I'm guessing this might have been a Christmas performance. So what did it feel like to dance that at the time? Take us back to the 13-year-old you. Well, I had started dancing, gosh, maybe six or seven months before I had taken my first ballet class on a basketball court. And I had joined the ballet studio on full scholarship. It was the first time in my life that I felt like I was a part of something that was bigger than me, that I was a part of something that um, was consistent um, in my life, that um, was beautiful, that made me feel strong, and that I had a voice. There was a sense of security and safety around me that I felt by being a part of the ballet world, by being on stage. And, you know, my, my home environment was really chaotic. There was a lot of moving around. There was abuse. So ballet gave me this this beautiful bubble that I was existing in um, that, you know, the worries of having to go on stage and perform and, and remember an entire ballet, that was nothing compared to the struggles I'd already experienced it by 13 years. Um, it showed me empathy. It showed me sympathy. It it opened me up as a human being. And I think that the arts do this in general for people, which is why I think it's so vital for the arts to be um, a part of our you know, education, a part of it should be a part of our school curriculum, um, no matter what the art form is. 11 years being the only person of colour in the company you were dancing in and on that track to be principal dancer and to be at the top um, of your craft. How did that feel and at what point did you ever ask yourself if you did why is this the case why am I the rarity here when I became a professional uh, it was a shock it was a shock to my system I mean of course I was very cognizant aware of the fact that I am a black woman Uh, my mother raised me though I'm biracial I'm black Italian and German both of my parents are are of of mixed race Um, but she raised my siblings and I to understand that as a, a black American when we leave our home we're going to be viewed as black it doesn't matter how much black we have in us that's how we are going to be seen and treated so that was a that was understood, but as a dancer, I was just Misty, this dancer. Um, so I come to ABT, and you know there were a handful of black male dancers that would come and go, and um, and I was always curious as to why why I saw them come and go as they did, um, and that I was the only woman that that was there, and. Um, you know, it did make me question everything. It made me question why me? I I always thought to myself, there's no way that I am the best. There's no way that I am the first to come around that was capable. Um, So that's when I started to kind of dig in deeper and do research on um, my heritage as a Black person, as a Black American, especially in the ballet culture. And that's when I stumbled upon so many incredible dancers that exist and had fruitful careers as far as their, you know, within that time, as far as it could take them. You know, I think of Raven Wilkinson and Janet Collins, um, and then, of course, Lauren Anderson uh, with the Houston Ballet. But um, until you're given a true opportunity, which Kevin McKenzie at American Ballet Theater eventually gave to me, uh, you know, you're not going to be written in history books as a Black dancer. And that's something I want to change. Did you ever feel that you were held back from roles by either by your color or by the perception of your color absolutely without a doubt um you know and that's what's so hard for me because people look at me and um and will say you know well their their dancers are so much darker than you like imagine their path and then i always off you know i say that um you know it has to start somewhere that there's discrimination no matter how much black you have in you if you don't have um 
pale white skin and fit in with the rest of the the, the group, the troupe, then um, you're going to be seen as other. The first time American Ballet Theater filmed the ballet at Swan Lake, um, and I was removed from the casting um, to, uh, for being in the second act because I would have kind of ruined the aesthetic, that's what's said, um, by being the only brown brown person um, in a, to, you know, the line of corps de ballet dancers. Um, but yeah, throughout, it's, it's, you know, dancers of color are often cast as these earthy, over-sexualized characters and never seen as soft, never seen as, um, as ethereal. And it's been... You know, that's why it was such a big deal when I was cast as, as the swan in Swan Lake or, you know, Juliet um, in Romeo and Juliet, because black dancers are never seen um, as given an opportunity to be romantic. Are there roles where you would say, actually, no, I think I shouldn't dance a particular role because I do think this role, there is something, there would be something jarring about having a person of a certain ethnicity. Or do you think we just now have to sort of say, look, we're going to be color blind about casting casting directors are just going to have to step up to that in the theater in ballet in opera i think that what's so incredible about ballet um and why i think it's survived for as long as it has um is because the purity of the technique which sees no color um it, you know when i think about the idea behind a, these are these kind of original concepts of these ballets um they're they're really representing the world. You know, you think of Labayadere in India and you think of Don Quixote in Spain. So why are all of these roles being danced by white women and white men? It it doesn't add up. So when they say that you have to look a certain way to portray these roles, you know, a swan is not a white woman. We're creating a character. So art is fantasy, I think. It's beautiful escape. A black woman can't portray the white swan. How do you define that? You know, it, none of it truly makes sense. Why is a black woman not capable of being a fairy? Are these are like mythical characters? They're not real people. Um, you know, if, again, if a white woman can or a white man can portray, um, you know, kind of this earthy black character and paint his face black, why can't a black person portray that role? It's just there, there are so many rules that have been bent that we really have to um, we ha really have to open up this dialogue and really get to the root of it and address it. But would you feel uncomfortable because we would now find blackface in most forms of art or comedy or representation to be something reprehensible. And yet we have had a, roles in ballet that were conducted like that. Is that something that needs to disappear from ballet as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that it has slowly gone away for most companies, especially in America. But, you know, I, I think it was two years ago now that I ended up in a, in a social media battle with um, with the Bolshoi Ballet because they still do blackface in their version of La Bayadere in Russia. You know, this this day and age, there are um, there are certain things, you know, if you want to be um, inclusive and you want the ballet to continue to be relevant, and I know that this is more of an issue in America, um, then you can't offend an entire community of people. Um, blackface has such a deep-rooted negative history. Um, so to continue to present that, why would the black community or the Indian community or whoever uh, who's you know being discriminated against or being offended, why would they want to come and support the, the, your company? Why would they want to come and support these things? So, um, you know, I think of it as, you know, these these monuments that are being taken down that are just reminders of of things, you know, bad parts of our history or, you know, things that we don't need to put in front of people's faces daily. You know, it's something to put in a museum, put in a history book. They're not something that should be displayed in, in today's culture and time. You've also uh, worked with President Obama. You were advising him on policy around fitness and also on reaching groups in terms of fitness and better body awareness who might not otherwise respond to that kind of public uh, health messaging. I mean, it struck me you had a fair amount in common, really, in terms of your background in tenacity and both raised by very determined uh, single mothers. Did you find the Obama years to be inspiring in a way that you think 
you can take forward for young Americans, particularly young Americans of colour, but not only, or something that, you know, we have then seen an abrupt reversal of a lot of those gains. So I wondered where you came out having met and worked with the former president yourself. You know, I think that as much as I see such a positive growth and change in the ballet world simply by my promotion, simply by seeing me on the stage in Swan Lake and and in the Firebird as a black woman, it has changed the possibilities and opportunities and futures for so many dancers who see themselves through me. And that's what happened when President Obama became the first black president of the United States. Um, And so for that, it, you know, it gave America, you know, a second chance, a new life to see um, future, a future for an entire group of people um, that, you know, America was built on our backs um, from slavery and this was a new beginning. And so, you know, that none of that can be taken away. That happened and it affected so many people. Misty Copeland, thank you very much for joining us. You can listen to the full interview on our podcast, The Economist Asks. Every week we publish a conversation we've had with a high profile figure. Click the link opposite to enjoy it. And thanks for watching.